So thank you very much for the <laughs> invitation for this conference. Um, so I'm going to talk about scaling of scoring rules, which is joint work with my colleague David Bowling, who is at KAUST, and I'm at Lund University. Um, and this talk, I will go through the sort of basic of uh, scoring rules in the context of uh, forecasting of um, predictions. I will start with sort of general review of the <coughs> forecasting and uh, predictions, uh, taking results from board slides from two this two audience doctor, and then I will go on to my own contributions about the scaling of the scoring rules. Let's see how this works. So basically, the simplest setting is that we have a single forecast, which is a scalar, which you can see A here. And then we're making observations. And we want to evaluate how good is this forecast compared to the observations. So we have two points, and we want to make some comparison. And whatever comparison we want to make, whatever distribution we assume, we will get different rankings if we have different forecasts. So, Two common square function is the classical squared error, for instance, or the absolute error. I used negative sign here just to make sure that sort of the, the largest values is the best, yeah, but of course, otherwise. And re regarding which <coughs> score you want you or scoring function you use, you will get different rankings on different forecasts. We can put that in a setting if you have a probabilistic forecast. So we have, rather than issuing a point forecast, we issue a, a predictive distribution of the forecast. So let's call that P, and we'll call it pre-fraud adoption. Decision, tells us, decision theory tells us that if we use the base predictor, we'll take the R min of the expectation of the scoring function under the <coughs> predicted forecast. So Y, the random variable Y, has the a distribution P, and then we will use whatever point estimate we can, which in the case of the squared error is just the mean of the distribution. And if you use the absolute error, we get we use the median as the focus. But what properties should we want for our evaluation of our forecast? Or what fun the function S to be? Well, if we have a prediction P, we'll make an observation Y. Well, we want to measure, and we measure the skill or how well the uh, prediction is using this function, where a higher value indicates a better skill. But what do we want first? Well, a very basic property that most people, I think, agree with, and me included, is that assume that the distribution of Y is Q, and our forecast distribution of Y is P then our um, performance metric should, at least in the long run, give the best value if we use PSQ, meaning that we can't modify the truth to get the better forecast. And if we do this assumption, so we say that the best possible forecast we can do, not necessarily strictly best, but best, is the the true distrib underlying distribution of the from nature, then it is a proper score. <coughs> and this is what we're saying here in this definition, or we, it's a definition of state at least, where you have a class of uh, probabilistic forecasts, and R, and the proper scoring rule is any function, so it takes a scalar and a probabilistic forecast and returns another scalar in such a way that if the expectation of the scalar is Q, then using SQ, the expectation of Y, uh, having Y as the expectation of Y, have the expectation of Y, the distribution of Y equal Q, then we can't use any better distribution to predict Y than Q. This is just what this is. Of course, the inequality is not strict, and there are a lot of different scores because this is sort of a very new criteria. For instance, we can look at the two previous scoring, score, uh, scoring functions. They are, in fact, scoring rules. So if we use the mean of the predicted distribution as, <coughs> as our, our 
predictor for the squared error, we get a proper score here. And if we use the median in our predictor distribution, we get a score here. However, these two scoring rules are in some sense limited in that they do not give any account of the uncertainty. And I think this is sort of nicely taken from this quote here from a monthly weather review already in 1906. But all those whose duty it is to re issue regular daily forecasts know that they are, are times when they feel very confident and other times when they are very doubtful. Uh, doubtful as to the coming weather. It seems to me that the condition of the confidence or otherwise forms a very important part of prediction. And in some sense, it says, says that we should take into account the uncertainty that our probabilistic forecast makes of an observation. If we have a large uncertainty, we should not expect the value to be correct, but we should also punish forecasts that are very uncertain but give the right value compared to ones that are very certain and give the right value. But if you look at sort of the mean absolute error, if you just plug in the median, we have no way to account for the uncertainty of the distributions we're using. Because if we go back, we can see here that any <coughs> distribution, as long as we know the mean or the median, these two, the predicted properties of this will be the same. And in some sense, we lose this uncertainty around observations. So we really want our forecast, or at least I think it's a good idea, to have forecast that takes into account the uncertainty and values them. And there are several forecasts that do this. So perhaps the most commonly used, at least in weather prediction and other, a lot of other areas, is what is known as the continuous rank probability score which is given by the equation you see here. And what this term entails is sort of, it gives you um, <coughs> an expectation of the difference between two independent random variables generated for the predicted distribution. And if we look at the expectation of this scoring rule, we get that the expectation is equal to this term also. So what we see is that we get penalized if we have a large uncertainty, because if a large uncertainty, then the difference between two random variables, independent random variables, we will be large. Whereas if you have a smaller uncertainty, we'll get less than that. But we keep the absolute error, sort of almost absolute error, expectation of the absolute error as a sort of penalization term for being incorrect, because this is our predicted distribution, this is the observation. So we keep the sort of absolute error, but we add a bit of uncertainty, uh, sort of penalization for increased uncertainty. Another popular score is the regular and I apologize that this should not be a minus here, is the low score where F is the density of P, which means that this is just a regular likelihood function. And of course, this is a very reasonable score. Uh, we will focus more on the CRPS because it's more used in practice at least in the sort of weather forecasting in other communities. It has the sort of appealing properties that these quantities can be generated even if you don't have a, a density available, so that you can sort of look at the ensemble forecasts where you just can generate predictions rather than knowing the exception density of the predictions. And there are many, many more scoring rules. This will be painted below. And here we can see sort of how the scoring, different scoring rules penalizes observations. So let me explain that. The gray, um, the gray figure in the background is our predicted distribution. And then given that we get an observation Y, we can see how we are penalized in different areas. And I should note that the sign here is reversed, so negative, the small value is the best value. And we can see that the, abs, the squared error is best obtained on the mean, which is here, and then how the deviation goes away. And we can see that sort of even for sort of most likely value, you get quite, quite large penalties for being wrong. And then you can look at the log score, which is the ignorance score, also known as, and we we'll see that it follows the densities. And here we have the absolute value, and the CRP is a smooth version of this. What you can't see is that if you had different scaling of this gradient, we would get different predictions 
for the um, regional score and the CRPS, whereas the CR, but whereas the absolute error and the squared error would remain the same. But I think this gives a nice intuitive feeling of how they are penalized depending on the distribution. Okay, so in a setting, what we one typically does in practice is that suppose that we have two forecasting methods and we observe n data points, y1 to y n. For each data point, you have the forecast gives you a distribution, which is a forecast, and then we just select the one which has the highest average of the two methods, or the highest average of the mean score. So you evaluate the score using your predictive distribution and your data point y, and then you take the average. And you typically say that the one which has the highest score is the best. And here is sort of you can see that. You have a little illustration of where you have dot, you have your underlying distribution, and you get lots of observations on how it fits. And, <coughs> so. However, there is an issue that is worth pointing out that sort of we want to entail more than the sort of proper scoring group. And this in the settings where you have several observations, and that is the scale. We're going to see here, we have two observations here, the green dots. So the first observation is zero, and the second is almost zero, but two here. And then we have two different predicted distributions. So this is our predicted models, each generating a predicted distribution for each observation. So what we see here is the black line is what I will unfortunately call model two, but you see that it issues a quite certain prediction around this green dot, observation one, and it misses a lot of observations too. <coughs> Let me test this. And then we have another um, prediction or model, we generate two predictions. Unfortunately, the red line is not very clearly here, but it's here. So we're more uncertain around this point, but we are basically the same uncertainty about this point and misses this badly also. And from sort of the eyeball norm, to me at least, it is clear that the black, if I were to average this, the black should be the best predictive distribution of this, in the sense that here it's very certain and gets it really right. Here both are quite uncertain and gets it very wrong. But if you used CRPS, and now the black line is model two, unfortunately, you will see that you actually get a lower mean CRPS compared to model one. So if you average your result in the predictive properties, you see that it actually says that the red line is the best model. Even though at least to me, in my eyeball norm, that <coughs> the black line should be the best. So what is issue here? Well, what we can see here is that the scaling is very different. You see here, we have very small scaling. We have an uncertainty basically to minus two and zero point, and minus zero point two to two, zero point two. And here we have an uncertainty between two and eight. So the scales of the two distributions are very different. And we will sort of make this <coughs> um, clear in another example also. Here we have two observations, sigma one, both following a normal distribution, where sigma 1 has where standard deviation is 0 0.1 and sigma 2 has standard deviation 1. And we're going to see how well does a predictive distribution PI, where we have an estimated sigma hat instead, using the average of the scoring rules, because we can actually, we don't need to sample here because we can explicitly evaluate how it performs. And what we get is the following graph where we have the country plots. So let me explain what's going on. For the axis, we have sigma hat one and sigma hat two divided by sigma one and sigma hat two. So we have them on the sort of same scale. And what we see here is that if we make incorrect assessment about sigma one, which is 0 0.1, 
it doesn't change the contours that much compared to if we change sigma 2, which was 1. We get sort of more rapid drop off if the relative error of our prediction of what the standard deviation of the second dimension is compared to the first dimension. Where if we look at the log likelihood and log score, we can see that we have this even behavior around the mode, and then it levels up quite evenly. And this is what sort of the issue we will see here is that the CRPS has this um, issue with scale. So where did we come into looking at this problem? Well, it's originated from us looking at the data set from uh, um, Kuslein Stein paper on locally uh, on Argo flow data. And what Argo flow data is is that you have these floats that measure the <coughs> water temperature at different depths. So it's a boy that dives down and measures temperature throughout the for the various data. And what one knew, and it's a report in this paper, was that at least along the surface or at a few hundred meters, the distribution is very non Gaussian, and then as it goes further down, it's more Gaussian. And so the contact loss, I got me and my co author, David Bolin, we're working with, on certain type of non Gaussian distributions. And we examine this data where we have sort of residuals of a deterministic model uh, nearby uh, New Zealand, as you see here. And I don't have a picture, but basically what we saw was the same we had in the two previous examples is that by the eyeball norm, the non Gaussian models were very much better, whereas, whereas if you looked at the CRPS, either the Gaussian was better or it really didn't matter. So this is sort of where we come from the statistics. And sort of to further illustrate this with scaling and why it matters in special statistics, we go through sort of a basic setup in special statistics, where we have a set of observations where we have data, typically irregular locations. And at least we make observations, y1 to yn. And Typically, what we do is we can use the average predictive uh, for cost for some score using some set cross language. So what we have here is a realization of the Gaussian process, which is the highest values in the upper right corner and the lowest values in the bottom right corner and smoothly varying in between. Now, what turns out to matter <coughs> when we do, let's say that we're all going to focus on Lee one cross validation is that we so we're going to remove one part. Use give the distribution get of all at uh, this point given all other observations. So what, there we will get, and if we assume things are Gaussian, we will just get differential difference in the mean and the standard deviation. This will be our prediction point. And if we know that the things are Gaussian, we can look at the true sort of predicted distribution for this Lee one cross validation, and we'll get a figure of different standard deviations for each Lee one cross validation. And this is what you see on the left hand side here. So what you see here is that this dot has the highest standard deviation because it's furthest away from all other points. Whereas if you look points that are very close together, they will have a low standard deviations. So what matters here is really is the distance between the location. But if we look at this generated data, we can sort of see that we have, we have an empirical density of the two uh, credence standard deviations. So each line here represents a point observation of a standard deviation for this. And in some sense, that does not fit into the framework where you have sort of the underlying measure Q, and then you have <coughs> your predictive measure P, and just compare them. Because <coughs> if you're further away, you will have a large standard deviation, both in your prediction but also if you have a reasonable model, you should have a higher standard deviation where there are a few observations. So you should expect that the standard deviation of the prediction and your target predicting measure is the same, or the true predicting measure. And this is what we try to quantify in the following way. So instead of having 
uh, one predictive measure and one true predictive measure Q, we have a set depending on the scaling parameters. We just assume that P has the same measure, but we can change the scaling of the measure by Q. And Q has uh, by C group. And Q has the same thing, it has a true measure, and then we can change the scaling around. And then we have this pi, which represents how different scalings occur. If you into, so, but what you see here is that sigma both enters the true predictive distribution, so the best we can do, and our estimated predictive distribution, p q hat. So, which I illustrated, we have not necessarily sigma, but we have some estimate that depends on sigma. So, if we go back. We can see here that this point is further away than all other points. So almost any sort of stationary or any stationary Gaussian distribution you fit will have higher standard deviation there. And the closer the observation is, the, the, clo <coughs> the smaller the standard deviation is. And it's reasonable that if the true distribution is Gaussian, yes, the best predictive performance you have is depending on how close your observations are. So it's reasonable to assume, at least if you have a reasonable prediction, that it should follow the same sort of behavior. Not perfectly, but, but at least we should capture it somehow. <coughs> it should be a tilde, this is the tilde here. Uh, just noting that this is, there is no such possible thing as plugging in a Y here, but we have this sort of hierarchical structure that if you can generate a sigma I from pi, and then you know Y I from Q sigma I, then the average of these samples, if we plug in sigma in this half estimate here, converges to this under some line conditions. And we can also sort of play around with sort of how this, what shape should we choose? Well, what shape you should choose, of course, depends a lot about the true sort of distribution, but also the shape of the locations. We can play around with this in the standard uh, Lieberman setting. So the previous sample was a realization where the locations are just the two-dimensional uh, uh, <coughs> Poisson point processes with random intensity. Then we can, if we generate the sample, we get sort of an empirical distribution of represents pi because it depends on how you get the different distribution. So if they're close together. Many points close together, you get small standard deviations, and if they're far apart, you get different standard deviations. And here I just illustrated three different examples of this. So we have the point process, we have a clustered point process, where we see that we get very close standard deviations, very small standard deviations, I'll say, because most points have many neighbors. If you do leave one out consolidation, you expect to get sort of a small uncertainty. Whereas here we have a bit of repilations, so you get a push to larger standard deviations. So recall then our issue that with the CRPS, which is not obtained with low score, was this that the scaling did you get penalized differently for using different scaling? If we then have different types of pies here, we should expect different penalizations. And in fact, weighting of the observations, we can think of them as CRPS. And since large uncertainty get penalized more for being wrong, if we have observations like this dot over here that are far away from other, it gets an overrepresentation in some sense in the CRPS. Whereas if you were to use the correct density and use the log likelihood or the log score, log, that's written, you get the following form where you don't expect to do this. Okay. But how do we quantify this mathematically? And it turns out that it wasn't trivial to us to get the shape, the perfect form. But one definition we have that we're quite happy with is that if we have a scoring rule, a proper scoring rule, and we have the measure with the, scale, with the location uh, mu and the scale sigma. If we look at the scoring rule around the <coughs> true distribution, which are in this case q theta, and we make a small permutation. So we are 
predicting but using a small sort of error in the both the location and scale, which is proportional to C. So we can make a standardized error of the mean and uh, the location and the scale. Then basically what we say that if these functions are hard more differentiable, and since this is a, the best possible value, we get the second order term here. And which depends on this how large the error is, which is t. But the important thing is this function, which you unfortunately call small s also, which is a scale function. And we say that the local scaling variant, if the, look, the scaling of this does not depend on either location or scale. So it means that wherever we are, it doesn't depend on sort of how the distribution looks whatever the location in scale is. And it turns out that we want to show that easily that the log score, so the log likelihood, is scaling variant. However, the scale function of CRP is, is locally scaled by sigma here. It's not locally scaling variant. And this, in fact, is the behavior we are capturing here. You see that, remember that sigma 1 is 0 0.1 and sigma 2 is one. So if we make a small error in this way, the error scales with sigma, which is 0 0.1, where here it scales with sigma 2, which is 1. We get higher penalized for scaling in the wrong directions, in different directions. And this is sort of the property of scaling values. So it's very important, or at least to be aware of, it. not necessarily wrong to have a scale not being locally scaling variant, in the sense that maybe you want to penalize more where you have large deviations, but at the very least you should be aware of it. And I should say that this is an, not an unknown issue with all unbalanced predictive distributions. A lot of work has been put in standardizing observations. For instance, when people have tried this, it should be a negative sign here. The issue is that it's quite easy to show that this is not the proper scoring. Because if we look at this, we will get less value, larger variance get. So we get no penalization for choosing large variance. So you let the variance go to infinity, you will have the best pick. Another popular method is using a sort of skill score where you use a reference measure and look at the, how it performs relative to this reference measure. However, in practice, this would require, of course, you to have a reasonable reference measure because if the reference measure is wrong, the predictive score will also be very wrong. For instance, this is the penalty against that. Another alternative is to use weighted CRPs, but it doesn't actually solve the scaling issues. So, what can we do? Well, if we look at the continuous probability rank score, we of course have a sort of a, a solution, at least in this case, or at least in our opinion, a solution. <coughs> we can see here that we have the absolute error, which doesn't scale term here, and we want to make this into something that is scalable. And basically, we can intuit and see that it's not scalable because if you multiply the same by sigma, you can move out sigma and mind everywhere. So you can expect that sort of variability and scaling will be perfect. So we want to scale this factor. If we look back here, you can see that we try to scale more. So how do we do? Well, it turns out that we realized and proved that this measure, which we call standardized continuous probability rank score, is in fact a proper score. So we have the same penalization for <coughs> the the prediction y here, but we scale it with using with the difference between x and other independent variable x prime with the same sort of if the predicted distribution was y. So in some sense, if we have a large uncertainty, this value will be large and thus we will not be penalized as much for making a mistake. And if it's small, we will get we will penalize more for making a mistake. And it turns out that at least what we are, the only one we have been able to prove is that you have to adjust with this log factor and expectation of this. 
Um, so the, we, we analyzed this from a result from Gnite and Rafti 2007, which shows that it assume that G is a non-negative continuous definite kernel. Then if it has finite expectation for any such negative kernel, this is a scoring. And for instance, CRP is obtained by noting that the G of X, Y, the absolute value is a non-negative definite kernel, so therefore we have a scoring. But in fact, any uh, alpha between zero and two is a negative definite curve. So any of these can. This is sort of a nice result. Uh, and we extended it by saying the following. We still have the G is our negative continuous, non-negative continuous negative definite curve. But we also have H, which is a monotonally increasing concave differentiable function on our plus. Now, if the correct expectation exists, we can use this formula here and get a proper scoring. So now we have a little bit more to play with. We have the negative definite kernel to use, but we also have this function H. And the proper scoring rule you get for plugging H half log X is <coughs> the uh, standardized the CRP is. But if you put H of X equal X, you're back into the previous theorem, which is sort of interesting is that it is the least concave H function you can have in the sense because any permutation of it in the wrong direction will give you a non-concave function. And we show that, un that unlike CRP, which has this scale function here, the standardized CRP is, is locally scale variant exactly like the dense, which you know, the minus one here. And so, again, I want to emphasize that it's not necessarily wrong to not be not locally scale invariant, but it is a property that you should be aware of when you do predictions, because if it's not something you want your predictive distribution to have, you should really use something that is locally scale invariant. And the convenient thing with the standard scale CRP is, if I go back a few slides here, is that if you can compute the continuous rank probability score using, say, uh, ensemble forecast of this, or sort of Monte Carlo estimate of this, and Monte Carlo estimate of this, you can just plug them in here and use it for the scaled, standardized continuous probability rank score has. So we have sort of the sign names properties that you actually don't need to know the distribution <coughs> of. P, you just need to be able to generate samples from it, unlike this log score. And uh, what could be interpreted is, as a downside, is, which I haven't mentioned, is that if you have a, <coughs> a deterministic forecast, you can use the continuously probability rank score because this term will just be zero, so you penalize with this. Whereas here, if this is zero, things go wrong. But we also show a truncated version of this can be used. But of course, this is not cumbersome. But as if one really likes the deterministic forecast, which we generally like, I don't. And I will just close by sort of the two final examples where, the, by the eyeball norm, the model two was the best, while we're a CRPS and we also tricked the observation in such a way that even the log score was the worst. But the scale CRP is correctly identifies the black line, well, correctly in our opinion, identifies the black line as the true distribution due to this scaling variance. And in some sense, the CRP is a bit more robust than the log score for these distributions, which means that this doesn't affect as much by the outlier points. So that is why the log score gets a little worse result. So if you see here, there is the red line, which is number one and the black line, which is model two, and we get a better result in this case. And to conclude again, this is just, again, when we have the various standard deviations, we can see that the scale CRPS has this local scale that it doesn't have a clear direction where you go and you get better results. And that was my final slide, so thank you very much. <laughs>